Hi everybody, it's Cindy from Asner Cindy, and I'm here at my office today, and it is Soapbox Sunday. Last week I started a series where on Sundays I take some time and I cover things from a medical perspective and point of view that are important to you that you've asked me about over and over again. So today's topic is fatty liver. And so what I've done is quite unusual for me. I have a PowerPoint that I've done. Normally I just talk to you from my car, my studio. Welcome as you guys are all hopping on. If you know anyone that has been told that they have fatty liver disease, if you know anyone that's worried or wondered about could I do a ketogenic or low fat, excuse me, whoa, 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 ha, low carb uh, way of eating if I've been told I have fatty liver, um, can I do this? Well, I hope today to help you understand what that is. So go ahead and hit the share button. Even if they haven't told you, they may be dealing with that and just not want to say that they've got problems. So please go ahead and share this to your page, to any ketogenic pages. Uh, rest assured, I'm not talking about any products. I'm simply going to talk about the anatomy and physiology. My page, Ask Nurse Cindy, is all about informed self-care. My family's been on the ketogenic diet for two years. I've given you guys time to hit the share button, and we've lost right at 800 pounds. So I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to switch the camera around. So welcome, and um, I probably will not be taking questions. I'm glad you're here. Um, ask them, and I'll try to get back to them. If there's other topics that you would like to make sure that I cover, please let me know. But what I'm going to do is move the camera around, and I'm going to show you my screen so that you can see these very important details. This is probably... Um, one of the most detailed PowerPoints I've done. So I think the visualization is going to be important. I'm going to keep it as simple as possible so it makes sense. So let's talk about that because I think most of us that have heard about people with some sort of liver disease or cirrhosis, uh, we might hear that they have hepatitis, we might hear that people have liver cancer, but what we're going to talk about, let me switch and welcome everybody as you come on. So make sure you hit the share button. So this can very, very important conversation. So let me see if I can get this where you guys can see it and hear me. So this is the PowerPoint I've done and I want to make sure that we go through it. I won't take very long because it's uh, once you understand it, you'll be able um, to go to dietdoctor.com or the Mayo Clinic or any of these other reputable places and be able to learn more based on your interest level. So why, what is fatty liver, especially non-alcoholic fatty liver, and why is it becoming such an epidemic problem for us in the US? So let me get my slides to advance, if they will. What is going on? Of course it does it on a live. Where is my cursor? Ah, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to have to move it over here to my other screen and show you here. I can get up close enough. So first let's talk about the functions of the liver. What's going on when, the, when we have um, liver function? You've heard of getting your labs and, you, and they're looking at your liver function. So when they do this, let me see if I can uh, make sure that you guys can see this. So feel free to share this because here's the three main things. Now the liver is one of the most complex organs in our body so far as having lots of functions. When we look over here, I've got my, my little fellow over here. I am in my office. So when we look at the heart, let me go over here and grab it. Um, when we look at what the heart does, the heart's the pump for our body. And so it, it brings in, you know, it receives, uh, Oxygen, uh, oxygen poor blood, it pumps it to the liver, excuse me, to the lungs, and then it pumps out oxygen rich blood. So that's what it does. But the liver, and it's the largest organ that we have, it weighs about three pounds. It's right under your rib cage. Let me show you back over here to this. Sorry if I'm in. Look how big that is. It's right under your rib cage, up against your diaphragm, weighs about three pounds. It's physically the largest organ that our body has. So think about a three pound roast. And here's its main functions. First and foremost, it's really, really important for detoxification. It's actually an honest-to-goodness real filter, and it eliminates a lot of toxins that our body either produces when we break down proteins and turn them into amino acids. A byproduct of that is ammonia, for example. So it will help excrete that, metabolize it, and have it exit the body many times through our stool. And then it has really vital function in waste products. So it will help detoxify drugs we take. It'll detoxify alcohol. And I'm going to turn the camera on for me for just a minute. Let's talk about alcohol. 
If we see alcohol as something that the liver views as toxic, many of you say, can I drink and still lose weight on a ketogenic diet? If you choose a no carbohydrate, uh, gin, tequila, vodka, things like that, and you keep your mixers carb free, you can drink. But here's what happens. When you drink, even though you're doing it for social reasons in the most case, your liver sees it as a toxin. So it has to detoxify it, and it will prioritize detoxifying your body of that alcohol. We've heard of all these uh, young adults, unfortunately, who die of, of uh, toxicity, alcohol toxicity. So it, the liver will stop all fat burning in order to process your alcohol. So just be aware of that. That's your call if you drink or if you drink often or much. But it will, uh, a functioning liver will uh, work on detoxifying that. It also is very important, second major thing, and I'm keeping this very simple. We could have talked all day about just what the liver does. But it synthesizes things. It, it regulates and helps. Oh, and I, I misspelled, misspelled metabolism. Metabolism. That's because uh, clearly my... I didn't drink, but anyway, regulates the metabolism of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. It produces the bile that's stored in our gallbladder. Yes, you can do keto if you've got your gallbladder out. Your gallbladder is just a reservoir for the bile produced in your liver. The liver's still going to produce it if your gallbladder's out. And it's very, very important in helping our coagulation process or clotting of our blood take place. Lots of other things, but those are the basics. And it's also third function is storage. It stores quite a bit of our vitamins, especially A, D, and E. And then you've probably heard about this when we talk about that it stores glycogen. Glycogen is a form of glucose that comes from metabolism of carbohydrates, and it will store it there inside the liver for quick and ready release in the case of sprinting, uh, maybe you become hypoglycemic, low blood sugar. So those are the main functions of the liver. Now when we look at the next slide, what would be risk factors that I found, and these are not all encompassing, and by the way, let me turn it back around. You guys look at me for a minute. I want to make this very, very clear. I am a nurse. I am not a doctor. This is intended for general education purposes only. I'm not here to diagnose, treat, or cure. I'm here to help you understand, hopefully, in a better light. So many of you commented last week after the type 2 diabetes. So many. It was so rewarding to me that you finally understood type 2 diabetes. Many of you are type 2 or you've been told you're pre-diabetic. So all I'm trying to do today is help you understand what non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is or what it is. I'm not here to tell you or guide you what to do or not do. So I want to make sure I'm real clear that my intent is that you find a practitioner who you can work with if you've been told you have fatty liver. So let me get back to my um, what the risk factors are. So these are published risk factors. Do you have high cholesterol? You're at an in increased risk of fatty liver. Do you have high triglycerides on your blood work? Do you have what's called metabolic syndrome, which is a, a conglomerate of five main things, one of them being obesity, hypertension, elevated triglycerides, a lot of the stuff that's on here. Um, are, have you been told you're type 2 diabetic? Are you obese? Especially do you carry your weight or your fat in the abdominal area? So men that have what we would call beer bellies would be at, if they're obese and they have high triglycerides, they're quite at risk for developing fatty liver or fatty liver disease. Believe it or not, interesting, I didn't know this one, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, you're at higher risk and that's due to all the hormonal imbalances. Uh, low thyroid or hypothyroidism, or if you've been told or have sleep apnea, all of these things contribute to the chance, not the assurance, but the chance that you are gonna potentially develop type, um, excuse me, fatty liver disease. So here's the normal liver. I showed it to you on my, my little fella here, and it tucks right up under the diaphragm. You see where the gallbladder is. Sort of behind that or under that is our pancreas. Our pancreas, of course, is the very, very active organ that secretes our digestive enzymes, all right, the other digestive enzymes. Here's a close-up of it. You can see how it relates to our pancreas over here. Here's our colon, here's our small intestines. So we've got two lobes. They're separated by this falciform ligament, and that's just important to know. It's in just general, it's three pounds on average, like I said earlier. So let's look at what else we want to learn about this. So let's talk about what is fatty liver. Now I'm talking about it, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we used to 
talk about alcoholics getting fatty liver when I was practicing out in the hospitals. And we didn't really see it or notice it in other people so much, but fatty liver with alcoholism, remember I told you alcohol has to be metabolized by the liver and it starts to cause problems over time. Now, however, fatty liver is hugely apparent in non-alcoholics. It's truly reaching epidemic proportions. There's two types of fatty liver that you need to know about. One is, is called NAFLD, N-A-F-L-D. Look at the first word, the first initial of these words, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So if you've been told you have a fatty liver that was probably found, you were probably asymptomatic or without symptoms, they probably did an ultrasound um, of your abdomen or a CT for what some other reason and said, oh my gosh, you have a fatty liver. Uh, I'll show you a picture of a fatty liver in a minute. Now, if that is not uh, if we can't stop it there, it does progress. Non-alcoholic fatty liver typically will progress and you're going to have liver function that starts to worsen. Fatty liver in and of itself is, is fairly benign. It's not going to really cause you much problem, but it's a big warning sign that you are, and if you haven't shared this, please go ahead and share this to your page. And it can progress to NASH, and I'll sort of try to show my cursor here. So NASH is the progression where you end up with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Steatohepatitis, what is that? That means that I have a fibrosis and cellular changes in my head. If you've ever heard of hepatitis, that's inflammation of the liver. Everything hepato or hep is going to be um, liver related. If you've been told that um, if you have tonsillitis, it's inflammation of your tonsils. Appendicitis, inflammation of your appendix. Uh, hepatitis, inflammation. So we have steatito, steato hepatitis. Okay, so that's the progression from NAFLD to NASH. And none of us want it, trust me. So let me show you what this, what this means, what the problem is with this. Let me delete that. So when you have a normal liver, you can see the uh, pathology. This is a slide of the cells right here. And this is just showing normal livers. It looks like liver that you would buy in the grocery store if you cook liver or buy liver or ever take out the, uh, the uh, package out of your turkey and you open that package up, you'll find the gizzard and the, and the liver in there. Now, when I have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, literally I have fat globules or deposits that are stored in the liver, which has enough to do. It's a very, very busy, very, very busy organ, and it doesn't need fat taking up space. Now, if it progresses to the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, now I've progressed to the point that I actually have inflammation, fibrosis, and scarring here, and this is where it really, really, really starts to impact um, function of the liver. Now, what's interesting about this is it actually enlarges the liver. If you can see this uh, scale, uh, this artist's rendition from a traditional size three pound liver up to this, this fatty liver actually is like having extra fat on your hips. It take fat takes up room. And this is going to cause a lot of congestion down in your abdominal cavity. So if you have some vague right upper quadrant, meaning if you look at your abdomen, if I were to take this and look at this as, here's my diaphragm. So that's, this is the abdominal compartment. And if I look at this and put it into four, four quadrants, right upper quadrant, okay, so this is gonna be a flip screen, but right upper quadrant, uh, vague discomfort could be that you've got some stuff going on with a liver that's becoming fat, okay? So I hope that's making some sense. Um, so it, it becomes enlarged, and if any of you know anyone that's ever had um, gastric bypass or the Roux and Y or gastric sleeve, they'll actually put you on a protein diet, a liquid protein diet, typically prior to surgery. And then a day or two prior, they'll actually have you fast. Why? Because when you fast, this liver fat will start to decrease very, very, very quickly. And you will, they can more easily, if they're going in with a laparoscope, those little tubes that they go in, in order to get to the stomach. Let's look over here where the stomach is. Let me pull the liver out. Okay, I just did this, I just did a liver resection behind that is the, is the stomach so it's sort of hidden by the the liver so if this liver is fat and it's in, enlarged because you're obese and you've got all that abdominal fat how do they get to the stomach to do the sleeve or to do the roux and why if they can't get to it so that's how how quickly fatty liver can at least be marginally addressed is by what uh, these surgeons are asking their patients to do so non-alcoholic fatty liver I got some of this stuff I got from the Mayo Clinic I got some of it from WebMD, so I want to give them good credit for 
the progression of this. So now what's the difference between NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis? Well, it, uh, NAFLD is just basically a excess fat in the liver. This is surprising, let me get in closer. Greater than 30% of the adults in the US and even they're thinking around the world, greater than 30% have it. If, you're, if you've got a family of six, two of you probably have fatty liver disease if you have those risk factors that we talked about. And this is, um, they think it may be higher, but it's only diagnosed typically if you have an other diagnostic work of your abdomen and they happen to catch it because it's pretty asymptomatic or without symptoms. Here's the really sad part. They're thinking about 13% of children. Think of the obesity rate in our children. It is reversible. If you've been told you have fatty liver, I want you to take some deep breaths. There's no drugs to treat it, but lifestyle changes can often impact it if you look at the medical literature. And there'll be minimal to no uh, liver function problems. Now, and this is what the um, pathology or, or close-up would look. Now, when we get into problems with NASH, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, now, it, you, you typically start here, so it makes sense that we would have a smaller percentage of adults in America that have that. Um, about 15 to 20% of all obese adults that you know have it, whether they're diagnosed or not, they have it. Additionally, comforting to know is that in the early stages, even though we've started to have some changes with some deposit of scar tissue, it's typically reversible in the early stages with the correct lifestyle changes, which you'll need to work with your physician about or search online, especially for low carb friendly websites. And I've got a quote from dietdoctor.com that would help guide you in the right direction. Um, you have the beginning damage to your liver function, liver cell injury, and it is becoming the leading cause of cirrhosis. I don't know how, oh, and, and this is only applicable if, and you drink less than two alcoholic drinks per day. If you are obese with central obesity in your abdomen, if you have high triglycerides and you drink, you are, you are putting the pedal to the metal. You are pushing down uh, the gas pedal, increasing the likelihood. I'm not saying absolute. I'm a nurse. I'm not here to diagnose, treat, or cure. But you are increasing. If you understand how our body functions when you put alcohol in it, it has to metabolize it and it will metabolize it as, as well as it can, but if it starts to have liver malfunction issues, it's harder and harder to metabolize it. So here's just a nice schematic. So this would be, this is like one liver, but it, it's just showing different slices of how this disease progresses. So the normal liver is going to look like liver that you see in, in the grocery store. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, you start to have an, it's, this uh, schematic doesn't really show that it gets bigger, but it does. This is where you get into the steatohepatitis, and that's where you start to really have fibrotic scarring, and literally left untreated um, can move into cirrhosis. And it, it is the leading cause of liver transplantation today in the United States, and since greater than 30% of people, um, you certainly don't have to have a liver transplant here or here, but this literally starts... Uh, starts to not work well enough that people can develop jaundice, their eyeball, you know, the whites of their eyes turn yellow, they have lethargy, they're not able to metabolize their food well. But if greater than 30% of America, I'm going to turn the phone back a minute. If greater, th if greater than 30% of America has, I, I have my thing signed on my driver's license that I'm a donor. But if they go to try to give your liver to someone who needs a liver transplant for liver failure and they go in and you've got steatohepatitis or you've got um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, your liver is, is no longer an option. And it's just, we're, I was thinking about this the other day, I've been thinking about this all week, like are we gonna get to some crossover point that we don't have enough donors um, or even someone that's willing, you can donate a portion of your liver. Our liver has a pretty tremendous capacity to um, sort of self-repair. And that's why this is so encouraging that it is reversible in many, of the situations. Now, what in the heck is causing this? Why, why, why are we getting into these epidemic proportions? And I want you to know, this is very interesting. Let me get a little bit closer. Uh, current research is indicating excessive, let's say this again, excessive carbohydrate intake is the culprit or one of the leading problems, ex especially fructose. Uh-oh, ruh -ro. Turn it back around. Holy crap, what do you mean? that fruit smoothie, that orange juice I've, I've had to drink every day um, since I was literally able to pick up a cup or drink from a straw. What do you mean that can be one of the leading causes of non-alcoholic? Isn't that healthy? Don't I need that to get my vitamin C? Mm. 
Well, tonight what uh, research is really leaning towards. Let me get closer to this. I found this fascinating. When I consume and my body breaks down a carbohydrate like a piece of bread or pasta or rice, that and it creates 120 calories of glucose, only one calorie of that on average is converted to fat unless you're just eating four or five bagels a day. Now, I take the same 120 calories of fructose, 40 calories of that is quickly and immediately converted to fat. Who knew, right? Who knew? So this goes in, and I think this is very interesting, that glucose is processed into energy, and it's stored as glycogen. Remember, our liver, one of its main things is to store things such as glycogen, and it can actually offer it to the muscles as well. So if we're not eating uh, tons of carbs in a day, like tons of bagels and bread and pasta and rice, we can typically, you know, function all right. Here's where the key is, look at this. Fructose has to be metabolized by the liver. It does not go into the normal bloodstream through insulin transport. The liver has to uh, metabolize that. So when we look at this, this was, I thought, fascinating. Glucose versus fructose. So if you've got somebody that's really, really unwilling to do low carb because they can't give up their bread or their pasta, if they'll give up fruit, if they'll give up fruit juices, if they'll look for the high fructose corn syrup and remove that, they're going to be so much better off from a health point of view than if they don't do anything. So I tell people, do what you can, be where you are. So look at this, fructose metabolism, 100% of that rests on the liver. Glucose metabolism, though, only 20% of that is dealt with in the liver. The remainder is via all that insulin stuff and being escorted the glucose out of the bloodstream into the cells. Now, I still don't want you to eat excessive carbs if you understand all the other benefits to dropping your, your breads and your pastas and replacing them with other alternatives. But it's interesting. So every cell in the body can utilize glucose. So much more is available after every meal. But fructose, get, look at this. Now, this is important. is turned into free fatty acids. VLDL, which is the bad one of the bad cholesterols, and triglycerides. I met a guy at a church. I did a talk last year at a Baptist church out in the country, and his triglycerides, he'd already been on keto for about, um, I think, probably a couple months, were 800. 800. I'd never met anybody whose triglycerides were 800, but he was all about the fruit smoothies and the fruit juice and you know the regular carbs like bread and pasta and fries and all that stuff. 800 and it was down to like 80 and he said his doctor is like whatever you're doing I want to know um, Because you've, you've totally changed your health trajectory. So high triglycerides um, that fructose is turned into triglycerides and That's much more readily stored by the body so people today are consuming fructose in enormous quantities, which um, has made, and not as, but which has made the negative effects much, much, much more profound. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of science, but I want you to know that there's actually real science. If you like to geek out on this stuff, or you're like a Dave Feldman or an Ivor Cummings, this is going to be like simple for you. But it's really interesting in that the metabolism of dietary fructose is independent of the energy status. So in other words, we have this unregulated hepatic fructose uptake. It doesn't matter how much you take in, your liver's like a workhorse. Your liver is type A. And it's like, oh my God, I've got to make take this fructose and I am going to have lipo. Have you ever had anybody have liposuction? Lipo, that means fat. The way they suction the fat out, lipogenesis, the creation of fat. Hello, hello, hello. Look at this, really amazing, okay? Um, only to 30, 40%, and this quote goes to the liver. The other one said 20%. It passes directly to the liver where it is metabolized almost exclusively. So quite a complex pathway, but I just, please, fruit juice is not your friend. There's like, heart, even if you get the one that my husband and I were talking about this and how we used to buy the fresh squeezed, extra pulp, blah, blah, blah. So where is fructose found or hidden? Hidden's probably a better way to look at it. Where's fructose hidden? So, uh, duh, fructose, fruit, fruit, fruit juices, fruit smoothies, not your friend if you have fatty liver. Table sugar, what do you mean? I thought it was like fruit juices. Well, table sugar, which is called sucrose, is one half glucose and one half what? Fructose. So this is dealt with via insulin and the intestines and getting into the bloodstream. This is dealt with by the liver. 
Table sugar is not your friend, and we know there's about 24 different names for table sugar. Let's look here. Oh, no. Not honey. Not the lovely, tasty honey. Agave nectar? Say it isn't so. Coconut sugar, raw sugar, brown sugar, pink sugar. I don't care what it is. It's, it's sugar. It's fructose. And then here's where we really get into trouble. It's in our mayonnaise. It's in our ketchup. It's in our our um, spaghetti sauces, high fructose corn syrup, evil if you've got fatty liver, okay? So I won't, I won't belabor that. You guys can look it up. So here's what I, I want to leave you with. You're going to say, well, what do I do if I have fatty liver? Well, you, you educate yourself. And this is a quote from dietdoctor.com, one of my favorite places to send people. They don't take any funding. There's great webinars out there or things on YouTube by Dr. Ken Berry, Dr. Eric Westman from Duke. There's a lot of great people that talk about this that you can look at. But look at this groundbreaking study. Low carb, meaning eating or diet, is an effective treatment for fatty liver. I encourage you to go on this. I encourage you to read through because there were three or four other things that low carbohydrate dieting absolutely helped with. So that's my through pretty quickly that's my sunday soapbox about why i'll, I'll turn this way so you can see my friend oh, you can't see him well <laughs> he has nothing to say he has nothing to say isn't that fun this is what i do for a living so um hopefully that made some sense hopefully it took something that's actually much more complex than i had time to do or could give um credit to so far as really explaining it to you there's uh, people, physicians, um, hepatologists who specialize in liver issues. So there's a lot of thought process that they're going to end up as we understand what excessive carbohydrate intake is doing to us and how much of the processing of glycogen and fructose happens in the liver. Their ability to guide health could be quite increased in the coming years. So that's pretty much the end of Soapbox Sunday. If you like these little medical education, trying to break it down into uh, more simple, understandable nuggets so that you can see um, that your health is so much under your control. Choosing the food we put in our bodies is one of the few things we truly have control over. I can't control the weather. I can't control traffic. I can't control my spouse's reaction um, to different things that go on. I can't control many times the workload that I'm given at work or other things that happen in the world for sure. I can change what I put in my mouth if I understand the benefit. Yesterday I did a, a, a live video on being steadfast, the power of being steadfast. And if you understand these pieces of medical value to you, being steadfast is a lot easier to do. So I'm asking Nurse Cindy, feel free to share this. Um, I appreciate your, your patronage and following me, and I hope I bring some value to you. If I do, hit the share button, like and follow me on my Facebook page, and we'll see what we can do to have you have better health by practicing informed self-care. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.